و دکتر انور چترز گمشغل هي بين اقلاقه ميتو على ملوؤ breaking the silence and intergenerational transmission of fear and distrust و دکتر انور قرل بوبت صوبت ابسالا و متامو قرل بوبت صوبت هوايستي سمل اي دکتر ايذي على identity development بيشاتو دتر الفو حمشو و من اقلايو كشوغل اخ ملفونو بيت صوبويو بيت صوبو د اوبسالا و كسملي ترميوثو غلبي انترسانتيو ايلي تكشوغل عليسبوثو دو تراوما و دي صحة داني دقل وي ملي عالهاني تقوثن مو عراق او تكتن مو عراق او تكوثن مي سوريا وعدو هاني سبوثو غلبي مهمني لاشنو عامذن لان احنا كتعنينا قطري عمروحا مواثري ذن هاركك بيبوطي بقار عنو كمشوشينا قي اسم القطر لانه شيء نحن هذا كدعوته بو بو سويت بري بك ما يومي. دتري سملي ترميوثو شو بقولوا مفقلك ثوا عمو عمو هانو بعينه دمرنا لتكتيو بعيني مهم اسير ان هيريتج وثوا نو حاطط مفقلو بتر الفوت لو تحصر عمو اريو وعم حورون حرين الدمسه وتفي ايبي ثوا تكتيو غلب الطو ولو كل يو حليبه هو عمي بس كو طلبنا بومدانو كم مشكرنا لخو طلبنا كو شورد على الفلحون حرين ايبي شكلانو انا قلق دوبينا ويحولوا ايلخ ميقرو انفير فقوث تودی غالب هلو شابو هلی خوستی اطرگام دو ای بو انگلیش هایو قدرتو مثلا توتو عامی ایف یو فالو می قد کمی بو انگلیزی ای بی هاپی دیس از ایم سایکولوژیست آف ریلیجن سو ویچ مینز مای تیوریتیکل بکراند از ویدین سایکولوژی بات مای فیل آف ستاری از ریلیجیس فنومنا سو I am not a theologian as, as a background, which makes a difference. Anyway, this is an interest of mine besides my other work, because, you know, we don't get finances for doing research on SAFO. You get finances to do other things which interest the government. And this is something you do beside your work, because that's uh, normally not, as I said, financed. What I have been interested in is the trauma that continues from one generation to the other. So my title is Breaking the Silence, and I will get back to why silence is so central, and intergenerational transmission of fear and distrust. So what is trauma? There is an individual as well as a collective cultural level. The cultural level is that it is that phenomena when members of a collective of a group have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves an indelible mark upon their group consciousness, etc. And this could be also counted on an individual level. We, ha we can talk of trauma on very different levels. Let's talk tra of trauma on physical level, stomach pain, uh, uh, fatigue, insomnia. We can also talk of uh, trauma on behavioral and social level, which is, deals with abuse of substances, aggression, passivity, withdrawal. But we can also talk of trauma on cognitive level. That means difficulty of thinking clearly, uh, avoidance of memories, nightmares, or trauma or on emotional level, which deals with fear, uh, anxiety, anger, guilt, depression, uh, hypervigilance activities. And we can also talk about trauma on spiritual or existential level, which is very interesting, is loss of faith, religious f as one example, or loss of some other kind of faith, and loss of meaning in life. All these dimensions need to be included in a discussion of trauma. Unfortunately, very often, today, trauma discussion is more on physical level because it's done by psychiatrists, and that is a different approach, or a limited approach. There is previous research on trauma and its effect on different generations. We have most of the research among Holocaust survivors, some among Armenian survivors. We have also some research on Vietnamese soldiers back to the US. We have some on indigenous Indian populations in the US, and then later on on Rwandan and Bosnian traumas. We have very little, or actually absent, on 
trauma among the Assyrians as a result of Sefer, not on a psychological and not on a research level. Let's have a quick look and uh, what we see uh, the topic occurring in previous research on other populations is very often dealt with silence, with emotional difficulties, with obsessional storytelling, with secondary traumatization, that is the trauma among the children of the survivors, uh, personal, social, family impacts of the trauma, transmission of distrust and transmission of fear from one generation to the other, we have a research on effects of mem on memory because of the trauma, and we have uh, uh, research on depression, on guilt related to tr the trauma, failure of metamorphization, that is Im Im creating pictures of what has happened, which is very interesting, and also failures of temporality, the time dimension. Uh, we have also research on remembrance, on mourning, on symbolization and ritualization of the trauma. So I'll try to come back to some of these issues, but as you see, there is a vast research on trauma. What I would, what I've asked and what I will present for you here is a very limited aspect of that research that I have done is among the Iraqi refugees who have recently come to Sweden due to the war in Iraq but who have had a background in Turkey before, that not themselves individually, but their grandparents. So through these stories, they tell me what their grandparents have transmitted to them in terms of what had happened uh, during uh, or after 1915. Uh, the age population here was about 27 to 60 years old. They've come to Sweden after 2000, and they individuals that have told me stories among 20 or 25, I have had gathered, I, there were five of them speaking about SAFO. Um, some of the codes, topics that would occur among the, in the stories with these five individuals were very often related to cultural genocide. Uh, and as you see there, the cultural genocide is exemplified by why they, what they meant. It was uh, related to feelings of distrust, uh, stories told by their parents as stories to be learned uh, on how to deal with life. It was topics on intergenerational relations, that is what our grandparents tell us to do or not to do. Stories of seifon, uh, impact in life and especially impact due to religious differentiation. Why I bring these codes together is that it is important that when you look at the titles here, when you talk of SAFO, you do it in different contexts. So each one of these topics brings up how you talk about it in relation to something else. Another topic was on stories as lessons to be learned together with intergenerational relations. So the grandparents would teach them about life, what we call enculturation, as a way to learn about life. Uh, another topic was intergenerational relations and distrust. It was about feeling unsafe and impact of life. So you see different kind of topics often come up together, not seldom with religious differentiation as a very clear example. There was a lot of coding or topics on fear, internal fear, external fear, and there was also a topic on existential level and why this has happened to us, and what this means as a community. So from this material, I have kind of drawn out two cases, which I think characterizes the content of these stories. The first case is about distrust. As on social level, distrust on social level is ex very well exemplified by uh, this female person, she says, about 50 years of age, she says, as a lesson for life, my grandmother would tell not to trust Muslim, no matter how good they are or they were. Instead, I was told to put my trust in God, to be strong and not to be afraid to do anything that was not according to the Bible. This is her story of, uh, in her relation to other populations and where distrust was very central. She also continues, she says, 
they will be satisfied to kill us for no reason. I read from time to time about Seifo, but why? Why did they kill them? It's the same now, and she's from Iraq. We are always the target which may be sacrificed with. They will kill us, why? Because we are Christians. That is her way of constructing her stories, but on both social and existential level. Another person, a male individual about his 40s, brings up a lot about fear. And on socialization level, that is fear as a mechanism of uh, bringing up your children, education. This fear starts from home, he says. Our families taught us about fear. Do not do this or he will do this to you. Do not go there, otherwise the car will run over you. Do not be late, otherwise you'll get killed. The fear is planted inside us in this way. And then that kind of fear he would bring up relate to what was going on today in Iraq, though he is now in Sweden. Nowadays we can see that the situation has been renewed again. The changes in our region give indications that the old situation will return. The extremism has showed up again recently, and if they do not get it under control, the same events can be repeated again. So it could happen, it is not far-fetched. Now, with that background, I mean, there is much more to bring up from the stories I, or the interviews I've conducted, but let's, let's, let's be satisfied with these and let's move on with some theoretical concept that I would like to introduce. Now, I almost cannot see myself, not even with lenses, 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 lenses. The theoretical level uh, is what one topic I found very interesting in previous research is called the death of time. Theoretically, it means the discontinuity, the eruption, between the past, the present now, and the future. Um, that means you cannot transmit, you cannot educate really your children uh, in, in a way of knowledge and how to behave in life. The second dimension of death of time is that the children of the survivors have memories that are transmitted to them by their parents, but they don't have an own personal experience of what has happened. So they have stories, but they don't have own images to those stories, which means they have to construct the images themselves. And the longer the distance, the more distorted the images become. The children become imprisoned in the parents' trauma because it's not their own. Uh, in an, as I said, imageless, timeless condition, condemned to repeat what they themselves have not experienced, not personally. However, they do re-experience similar events later on, and then they connect to what their parents have told. Now, if we bring that to the case of Seifo, which I find in my material, that the happenings of Seifo, though not experienced themselves, it was at least three or four generations ago, become personal again through the new atrocities during the war and accentuated, increased, by the stories told by their grandparents. So the war going on now increases and revitalizes what has happened before. And that links the past with the future, but not in a constructive way because the longer the distance between the past and the situation today, the more your own mind has to create images. And those images are not the same images as their parents have experienced. Depending on the individual, those images can be destructive or constructive, very often destructive. The other concept which I find very interesting is the death of language. Theoretically, it means there is a threat of extinction and a process of dehumanization that lead to a world without metaphors, a world without a language. There is a disturbance, for example, we know theoretically, of dreaming, sometimes even the inability to dream, or when you dream you have hallucinations or you have nightmares and they are repetitive. They come to in your dreams, you don't know why. 
Through those dreams, you create images, but you don't have the language to understand that. So this lack of metaphor, this lack of language, hinders us to build both a personal and a collective story, a narrative. A narrative is an identity story, but without a language, we cannot build a, a, a functioning narrative as individuals or as a group. Because that then doesn't give us an ability to understand and what is meaningful in life. In the case of Seifo, the ability to linguistically express and to articulate feelings of trauma is dependent on a few issues. So in order to be able to linguistically uh, express your feelings, you need to have a few things. First is that it shouldn't be a silence around Seifo, and we see just the opposite. It's a strong silence around Seifo, especially with the first generations. It shouldn't be an ability to ritualize, which we see the contrary. It's very difficult to ritualize what has happened and to symbolize what has happened. So again, a lack of language in terms of uh, finding ways to communicate uh, the past of Seifo. Also, then the third one is the limited recognition of Seifo worldwide. There is a, even a misrecognition of Seifo, like, well, this didn't happen, this happened in another way, which is not really what you think it was, and uh, it is very difficult to get an acceptance of the world community, so on a, on a cognitive level. All these aspects hinders the ability of the, for the human being to create uh, metaphors of what has happened. And you need those metaphors to create your own identity, both as an individual as, and as a group. The cultural work is very important because this is what we are doing. I want, uh, I see the time is limited, but it is about collecting memories of the past. <clears throat> when something like a genocide happens, people are getting killed, what is really taking place is that the communication between one generation and the other generation is cut off abruptly. You cannot pass on any more knowledge, experiences, uh, norms, values. It's just cut off. So what we are trying to do from today, looking back, is to rebuild that connection with the past by gathering memories from the past. So we're actually trying put, to put together pieces of the past, like a broken glass, and trying to create a new image. So imagine how that would work. In the case of Seifo, fear is expressed very often in very specific ways. We've had historically, before, sorry, before Seifo even, uh, concepts we would use like uh, the rumoye, as a way to, uh, to control or scare the community or the individuals. Then there were the Muslims or the Janderma. So we have had used different kind of concepts to create that uh, issue of socialization, actually, to teach the children to keep within the limits we would like them to keep. I think today one of those concepts used is assimilation. Beware of where, what's happening. And that is, again, I think, a new concept, uh, not specifically related to SAFO, but as a way to control. Um, we have, what I see at least, that is analysis I do of the stories I've uh, read, is that we create a new narrative today, which is very much construct, built upon opposites, us and them, ahna uhenne. The us is the all positive, all good, while the others are all negative, all evil. They are often the Muslims, they are the Kurds, or they are the Turks. That is the construction we do, which is very dangerous, of course, because this is built on opposites that are not, um, as, uh, as you were, Bashar, pointing out, built on stereotypes on other people. This creates strong boundaries, strong limitations of what is acceptable, 
what is not acceptable, what is desirable, and what is not desirable. I very much like to go back to Gilgamesh because I think this is what the oldest story, as far as we know, talking about trauma. And he says, it could go on for years and years, and has for centuries. What this myth, I think, tells us is that in life, there is destruction. That's part of life. That's a part of our humanity. There is a universality of death. We are all going to die, and there is no difference in front of death. Not even Gilgamesh could escape it. Third, we also construct. We build up. We build up the culture. We build up the environment. But then again, it is destroyed. This is, these are the experiences of Gilgamesh. And still, he returns, but he doesn't return to Uruk as the same individual. He returns with new knowledge, cumulative knowledge. He adds on each experience. If you read the story, there are so many stories within the story. Each one gives him a new experience. But he's never going back to the same place. He's always building up with new knowledge on top of the previous knowledge. I think here we can find metaphors of, for example, safe for or similar aspect. I won't go into this. There are three key points of healing which we have to move on to. We cannot stay only with the trauma or within the trauma. One is knowledge, the other is respect, and the third is connection. Knowledge is to understand why do people harm each other? Uh, and we have to trace, and that is what we do, what has happened in history. Respect is the collective testimony that listening to other people with an empathic level. I tell my story and you tell your story. Why do you look at it your way and how come I look at this my way? And the third one is to connect to each other by doing similar work. Uh, there is also another dimension, and I'll try to end up, that letting it to go. We have to let things go in order not to be identified with the trauma. It is one thing to have a trauma, but it is another thing, a dangerous thing, to be the trauma. It's two different things. And I think what is going on now is part of the healing, and we are creating now those rituals and those symbols to deal with the past. We go to a certain place, we do things, certain things, religion, culture, are used, and the resources within them are used in different ways. F sorry, this is the final, I promise. What this points at is actually what Ferreira has talked about very much. We need a liberation psychology. We need a change in our way of looking at our past. We, c we shouldn't talk of any more as victims. We are the victims. They have been the perpetrators. We need to get rid of that kind of language, because as long as we use that language, then we are also stuck in that le hierarchical level of relations. We need to see ourselves as part of that constructing our future. And this requires a reconciliation with uh, people who we see are the perpetrators. There is a different kind of research I would like to point out that we could do together. And uh, I think my time is out, so let's have a time for discussions later on. Thank you.